Our second gospel reading this morning is also from Matthew. Jesus has spent over three years teaching his disciples and is in the northern city of Caesarea Philippi, preparing to make his final journey southward to Jerusalem, where he would be crucified. Hear now the reading from the 16th chapter, verses 13 through 19. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, the rock, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Here ends the gospel reading. Good morning. It's good to be with you here again this morning. My wife Kathy and I were here on New Year's Day to worship with Jeff and Kelly and his, their awesome family and to say hi to Pastor Tom. And as I was telling Pastor Tom about the new opportunity for prison ministry finally opening up at the nearby Grafton prison, he invited me to speak to you this morning about the Kairos ministry. So here I am. And it's so great. I feel like I'm among among friends this morning with Penny in the lay speaking ministry. Um, we have people from the uh, former River Life Church, some of my family, and uh, even Chuck from TCI. So it's, uh, it's great to be among friends, and, and certainly all of you. I, I thank you so much for your hospitality this morning. Would you please pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. The scripture readings this morning may seem unrelated. In this last reading, Jesus and his disciples are in Caesarea Philippi, which is a stronghold of the pagan god Pan, the god of fertility. It is also the origin of the Jordan River, which emanated from a cave which came from deep underground. It was thought that this was the entrance to Hades, where the chief god Beelzebul spent his winter. Then when Beelzebul returned in the spring, the area around this flowing water source would again return to life, it being a very fertile, vegetated area. You can still see indented areas in the rock face of that cave where statues of Pan were mounted. It's understandable then why Peter's statement of faith includes the words, son of the living God, as opposition to the idols in the area. Jesus then states emphatically that he would build his church upon this rock, And hear this, and the gates of hell shall not prevail. In fact, just to be very clear, let's rephrase this to read, the gates of Satan shall not prevail. In the Protestant tradition, this rock refers to Peter's confession. Another interpretation might even say that Jesus would build his church even at the very gate to Hades. However literal or symbolic you may want to interpret this passage, let's just focus on the word prevail. The dictionary defines prevail as to prove more powerful than opposing forces, to be victorious. The interpretation then would be that these gates would not be more powerful than the opposing force, since the gates of Hades would not have been built to keep Satan out. A more accurate description would be that the gates of Satan would not prevail or stand up to God's opposing forces, that is, his church. So Jesus is saying here that even Satan's gates would not stand up to his church. Satan has a strong hold on this world where sickness, poverty, hunger, and prison that we read from Matthew are abundant. And we, you and I, are directed to take action. In our earlier reading from Matthew, Jesus lays it on the line that we'll be accountable for our actions or non-actions. Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or sick 
or in prison. He commends those who helped even the lowliest as if they were helping him personally. We're expected to take initiative in attacking Satan's strongholds in this world and to serve Jesus by serving others. We support Jesus and oppose Satan by positive actions, not just by what we say, not hiding behind stained glass windows and pious words. Mark Twain once wrote, it ain't those parts of the Bible that I can't understand that bother me. It's the parts that I do understand. And that reading of Matthew has always bothered me because I do understand it, and I wasn't measuring up very well. In 2001, my wife Kathy and I went on a spiritual retreat called the Walk to Emmaus, after which we were told to go back to our church and serve him. It had been such a spiritual high for us that we were excited and enthusiastic to look for new ways to serve him. Soon after, I was enjoyed to, invited to join a ministry called Kairos that would be sending a first-time team into Trumbull Correctional Institution. Now, I had some thoughts about prison ministry, that I was a college grad, a middle-class white male, nothing in common with felons, nothing to say to any of these criminals who probably were where they deserved to be, and were being supported by my taxes. Yeah, I was a spiritual snob. So when the invitation came, my head was ready to say, no way. But surprising to me, my mouth said, okay. Well, as an out, I decided I would see about it, and at least I could say I looked at it before I said no. But I learned that kairos is a Greek word meaning God's special time. In Greek, you can express time as chronos. That time was the same for everyone. At work, starting time and quitting time is chronos. And then there's kairos, God's special time. Let's say a doctor tells a pregnant woman that her baby will be born on June 17th at 4.30 p.m. Now that's chronos time. It means the same to the doctor, to the mother, and to the father. Now imagine that on June 10th, she wakes her husband and announces, it's time. Her husband had better not say, no, you're wrong, it's not June 17th, go back to sleep. Because it's Kairos, God's special time for that child to be born. So Kairos, at least applied to prison ministry, is God's time for something special to happen in the life of that prisoner. The God who has known that prisoner all along is preparing to meet him in a very special way. And I was amazed to find out who these prisoners really were that they had faces, names, real pain, and issues. Some were just young men who had made some horrible decisions, perhaps because of peer pressures, gang associations, or drug or alcohol influence. You know, it's believed that 99% of inmates are there because of a father who should have been there for them, or a father who was there and shouldn't have been there because of the abuse or conditional love that led to violent behavior. And let me be very clear about one thing here. We are not prisoner advocates campaigning for prisoners' rights. We are advocates for Jesus Christ alone. We may witness to these men and pray with them and for them, but we never appear before any parole boards. Justice decisions are left to the prisons and to God. We do, however, recognize prisons, especially like Trumbull, Grafton, and Ohio State Penitentiary, as Satan's strongholds. Many of the men at Crumble are serving long sentences, 25 to life, even life without parole, for their violent behavior and sexual offenses. Prison life is filled with loneliness, isolation, and rejection, as well as violence and abuse. Last June, after years of prayer and false starts, we were finally allowed to send a team into the super maximum security Ohio State Penitentiary to work with death row inmates one of the few teams in the nation to do so. So how does this program work? Well, at Trumbull, a team of about 36 to 42 volunteers go into the prison for a Thursday through Sunday weekend, about every six months. We host a corresponding number of prisoners, and each team member is randomly matched with a prisoner as a special friend or host to provide any special assistance they may need during that weekend. Although the team for death row is smaller and security is much tighter, the basic program is still the same. The team of volunteers actually starts working together months before the weekend. 
learning our various functions, getting familiar with prison rules, and praying for each of the prisoners, as well as praying for each other and getting to know each other. It's a serious mission and not to be taken lightly or without the power of the Holy Spirit. Each team brings in about 6,000 dozen homemade cookies. That's about 150 dozen per team member. They're homemade, baked with prayer and love. These cookies are the very core of what we do to show a special kind of God's love. It's also a chance for people who don't go into the prison to participate in a very loving and essential service. Grandkids, church confirmation classes, adult groups, or just individuals bake these special cookies and pray over them. Even prisoners not attending the weekend will be visited by some team members to give them cookies to show them God's love as well. We also bring in home-cooked meals for lunch and supper for these days. In addition to cookies, we also provide fresh vegetables and fruits for snacks during the daily activity times. Word about these special foods motivates many inmates to request to attend a weekend. But there are no special eligibility requirements other than the prison's confidence that the attendees are capable of good behavior. We've even had several Muslims attend. But there's also some fear among the attendees about what these strange Kairos people will be asking of them in return. You see, in prison, everything has a price. Nothing is free. For the initial two hours on Thursday evening with the inmates, who are a little reserved and skeptical, we explain the program and introduce ourselves to each other. Team members then leave at 8 p.m. to spend a night at a nearby church, as we do every night. We return at 6 a.m. to prepare for the inmates' 8 a.m. arrival. Each inmate is assigned to a table family composed of six inmates, two Kairos volunteers, and a volunteer clergy. They will stay together as a family for this entire weekend, including mealtimes. Assignments are purposely random, preferring to let the Holy Spirit work his will. So there may be rival gang leaders or racial issues at each table. Usually the first day is met with natural tension as the prison mentality of power and control is prevalent. These attitudes fade fairly quickly, though, and by Saturday the families are bonding well and interacting like this was a normal occurrence. On death row, inmates may have previously been allowed to attend only very selective meetings, never more than four, four inmates at a time, and at most only a couple hours. They are usually brought in and taken out in hand, leg, and belly shackles. Death row inmates are always one to a cell and remain in their cells usually about 23 hours per day. Even meals are brought to the cells. Any earned free time outside the cell is one at a time, unlike the inmates at lower security Trumbull, where cells are two-man occupancy and there is more personal freedom to go between buildings like the library, the chapel, the gym, and the chow hall. For this Kairos event on death row, however, inmates are escorted to an area outside the meeting area and allowed to enter themselves. The 18 men are unshackled during the entire 12-hour day in this dedicated cell block area. This in itself is a major event for these inmates who have been there an average of 25 years. Each day there are five Christian-based talks prepared and presented by team members with an emphasis on personal testimony about our own personal encounters with Jesus. Following each talk is meditation time, prayer time, and a time for table families to creatively present what they heard in each of the talks. The talk topics may range from friendship with God, choices to you're not alone. By Saturday, it's amazing to see the bonds that are forming among inmates, as well as team members and inmates. Tears and hugs are not, trust, I should say rather, trust and hugs are not normal in the prison confines. But now the inmates start to open up to others especially within their families, allowing themselves to become a little more vulnerable. Saturday is an especially critical day. Everyone is given a special piece of rice, rice paper and invited to write throughout the day to those we need to or be forgiven by, including our own names. Now that may seem insignificant, but a lot of attitudes stem from the fact that they have never felt forgiven or even capable of being forgiven 
even if they themselves had been victimized in the past. Forgiving themselves for their crime or their past life is extremely important for their spiritual healing. Prior to the weekend, each team member has written a short but personal letter to each of the inmates. After lunch on Saturday, the inmates are given a special time to receive and read those letters. Inmates get few, if any, letters from the outside, particularly the long-term inmates. So it's not uncommon to see tears as years of rejection and hardness begin to melt. They'll take the almost 40 letters back to their cells and reread them often. Afterwards, each family is provided a private place for family prayer. Sitting in a circle, each person may pray quietly or out loud as they hold and pass around a, a hand cross. This may be the first time they've ever prayed, perhaps their first prayer spoken out loud. Some pray thanks for being put in prison because on the outside they know they might already be dead. And also they would have missed this time, this special Kairos time, to feel God's love. Usually after this prayer time, there are hugs and tears as if the family has known each other and loved each other for years. The tears of love and joy are felt by team members as well as inmates, as only the Holy Spirit can move. The day gets even better. There's a time of open mic where inmates may come up to the microphone and speak their minds. Invariably, they will talk about how they have never experienced this kind of love and food and how much the weekend has meant to them. Many will openly confess Jesus Christ as their Savior for the first time or recommit their lives to Christ. Wes, for example, is a black gang leader. Although his father is a Methodist minister, Wes has been an atheist for the past 11 years. We never ask about their crimes, but I suspect Wes's gang activity ended in violence. Through his tears, he confides that no one had ever seen him cry since he was a baby. Continuing in tears, he says that he had come for the weekend for the food and cookies. That's all. But he was so moved by the outpouring of love and fellowship that he had asked Jesus back into his life the night before in his cell. Then he called his mother and read her a poem he had written to apologize for becoming the son that he had become. As he read the poem to us, we all began to join him in those tears. Another Holy Spirit moment. Remember the piece of paper with the names we were compiling for forgiveness? Saturday night is the forgiveness ceremony. Each of us takes the special rice paper to the altar, prays over it, and with the team clergy, places the paper in a clear bowl of water where the paper immediately dissolves, symbolic of sins being washed away. Afterwards, a pastor washes the donor's hands with clean water, further amplifying the message of forgiveness. Some of the men come away with a look like they've had the weight of the world lifted from their shoulders. Russell, for example, shares that his mother had died in his arms after his stepfather shot her. He has never forgiven him for that. But through his tears, he says that now he has forgiven him and would like to write him to tell him that. That would take a continuing, strong effort on his part. But how long had that weight been on his heart? How much of that was responsible for his, his incarceration? Russell had been on prescribed medicines that were obviously fogging his brain. Shortly after the weekend, he was transferred to a medical facility, and I didn't see him for a couple years. But one day he was back, and he came up to me with a strong hug. I noticed how well he looked. He said he was now off meds, and he felt really good. He hadn't been able to locate his stepfather, but I'm sure the forgiveness was basic to his long, continuing road to healing. Previously, I told you that each team brings in about 6,000 dozen homemade, baked with prayer and love cookies. One inmate, Ed, kept asking about those cookies. Where did they come from? Who baked them? They baked them for us? Really? Why? He just couldn't get over the fact that someone on the outside actually cared about inmates and would do that. And we would assure him that God had blessed us so much that we just wanted to share his love with everyone we could. Ed accepted Christ in his life that weekend and rarely missed a meeting after that. He smiles from the heart and always welcomes us with a strong and loving hug, never ceasing in his thanks. 
before the final closing ceremony, each inmate who agrees to do so has a cloth cross placed around his neck as the words, Christ is counting on you, are spoken. The inmate is to respond by saying, and I am counting on Christ. He is then given a Bible, and a hug is shared. Having been the weekend leader on one walk, I can tell you that heartfelt hug can feel like your ribs are being broken. What a change from that first night. When it's finally time to leave, you feel like you really don't want to. Inmates and team members feel like family and that you're leaving them behind. But we assure them that some of the team will be back every Thursday night for a prayer and share meeting. Many Kairos volunteers will be back monthly for an alumnus fellowship gathering. Tears accompanying the parting words, I love you, brother, as the weekend closes. How well does the program work? Statistically, 70% of first-timers in prison will return, except for those that have gone through Kairos. Then that percentage drops to 30%. The heart changed by Christ is the real rehab process. To date, almost 750 men have gone through the program at Trumbull since our first team in 2001. By the way, this cost the taxpayer absolutely nothing. Funding is from individuals, organizations, and even businesses. There are some very dramatic results. One inmate, Joseph, was scheduled for execution in October after our June weekend at Ohio State. He led our Sunday night fellowship in August with the news that he had accepted finally Christ a few weeks ago and was no longer afraid to die. And he asked to meet with his victim's family to ask for their forgiveness. Well, they did meet with him, and they not only forgave him, but asked the governor to withdraw their support for the death penalty. The parole board then recommended eight to nothing to withdraw the death penalty. Three days later, the governor commuted his sentence to life without parole. And Joseph is now at the Toledo Correctional Center, where there is a strong Kairos program. Was this God's special time for Joseph or just a mere coincidence? I don't believe we have a God of coincidences. I do believe that not even Satan's gates can prevail against God's special time. Recently, after years of prayers and delays, the medium security Grafton prison has now asked Kairos to come in. Most of you are aware that Grafton is not very far from here. But as thankful as we are for this opportunity, this will stretch our volunteer base severely, as well as present a larger need for cookies and funding. And this is where you can help. As a volunteer to serve on a team, no prior experience needed, only a willingness to serve him and obey his calling. You may serve on just one team or continue on others as your time and willingness allow. Or as a cookie provider, we need help to bake all those cookies, all baked by volunteers, Sunday schools, grandparents working with grandkids, families. And I will be willing to contact this church when we need the next cookies for the team going in August. Or as a financial backer, we're strictly a nonprofit, privately funded organization. Our funds are almost all directly applied to the program. It costs about $150 for one inmate to attend a weekend, so funding is critical. If you can help, please see me after the service. Prisons are Satan's playgrounds that breed hatred, violence, and lost hope. But we can attack the gates of those prisons. Those gates have not prevailed. Are you willing to go on the offensive to attack Satan's fortresses? Are you willing to help even the least of these children of God? Are you ready to feel the triumph and joy in his service? Amen.